Hello, my name is Bill French, and I invented this uh, MOBA globe here in uh, Cardiff by the Sea in California about 15 years ago. And I want to make a video uh, describing as quickly as I can how, the, how it works, what makes it work. So obviously it's kind of a mysterious object. And explaining what that is, uh, it's a, there's a clear outer shell, and then there's an inner ball with graphics on it. And between the outer shell and the inner ball is a fluid, about an eighth of an inch thick fluid. There's a light fluid on top here, and then there's a heavier fluid on the bottom. These fluids are not mixable, they're immiscible. So the heavy fluid stays on the bottom. The virtue of this structure is that if you adjust the weight and volume of the inner ball correctly with the light fluid volume and heavy fluid volume and density of these things, you can get to a situation where the inner ball is, is floating halfway between the top and the bottom. So it's not touching up here and it's not touching down here. And then when the ball rotates, when it's driven to rotate, the fluid forces make it not touch on the side either. So when it's rotating, the inner ball is not touching anything except fluid. And uh, since the uh, viscosity of these fluids is fairly low and the speed is very low, there's almost no drag between the inner ball and the outer shell. And as it goes slower and slower, the drag becomes less and less. So this is a perfectly, almost perfectly friction-free environment, which means the inner ball can turn with very, very little energy, which is important because we don't have much energy. Okay, so this shows the motor inside the inner ball. And it basically is a motor that I designed to operate at very low speed and very low current uh, and, and very low power. And it receives power from light. Light passes through the, the graphic. There's a graphic pattern on the outer shell. And the light passes through that graphic. About 10% of the ambient light passes through it to solar cells. Solar cells uh, drive the motor. Uh, the motor is typical in a way that it's a motor body and it has a shaft. And the shaft, in a normal situation, you would power the motor and the shaft would rotate. But in this situation, we want the motor to rotate. So it's kind of <coughs> kind of a reverse situation. And uh, the question is then, well, how do you drive the motor to rotate? And the answer is, well, you have to have some way to stop the shaft from rotating. If you, if you think of this um, as, as floating in a friction-free environment, if you could reach in here and grab the shaft and stop the shaft from rotating, then the motor would create torque between the shaft and the motor, and, and the motor would rotate, and the motor being attached to the uh, graphic, the inner shell, would cause the whole inner shell to rotate. So the, the trick is, how do you stop the shaft from rotating? And the way I do that is I say, okay, I'm going to attach a compass magnet, a very strong magnet to the shaft. And that sh uh, compass magnet uh, acts like a compass. It's, it's on a shaft with a good bearing on the bottom and a good bearing on the top. So this, this compass aligns itself with the Earth's magnetic field or whatever ambient magnetic field there is and stops the inner shaft from rotating. So given that the inner shaft can't rotate, then the motor can drive the body of the motor to rotate together with the uh, shell and uh, just create rotation. So that's the, uh, that's the trick to it. Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, I thought I'd spend a few minutes if you're interested in explaining to you how I invented this. Uh, inventions, I suppose, happen in a flash, but everybody knows that there's a lot of steps that lead up to that invention. So in my case, I became interested in physics when I was about 10 years old. My dad worked at the phone company and would bring wire home and I'd call it the wire, I'd make belts out of it, bracelets. And then he brought some batteries home and I hooked the wires up to the batteries and make sparks. And then my cousin Jerry White told me how to make gunpowder. So I got interested in physics and I started reading you know, electronics magazines and all kind, making all kinds of things. I made a little analog computer, I made a lot of solar powered things in those days because solar power was really cool, magic. Uh, did things with magnets and high voltage and magic tricks and uh, just all kinds of things because I had a lot of free time. In those days, when you were in elementary school and junior high school, you didn't have a lot of homework. So I could come home and just play. 
And for me, that was going to my dad's garage and just making things and buying little electronic things and just having a lot of fun. My Uncle Howard was an inventor, and he would come by with toys he invented. So I got the idea that one can maybe invent things and make little fun things. So that was all through junior high school. Once I got into high school, uh, I start, got into the phase where I had to do homework, so I didn't have as much time. And then in 1961, I went off to uh, to UC Berkeley and, and uh, had no time. <laughs> had got a I got a, a degree in physics there in '66, a bachelor's degree, and then I went on to get a master's degree in physics at Cal State Long Beach. So in those days, you know, between making money and studying, I had no fun time. But at least when I got through. Uh, I had a, a really good uh, grounding in physics, and, and I was interested in, still interested in sort of gizmos, you might say. I wasn't going to make nuclear weapons, but I was interested in little magic, magical things. It was about that time that I was looking at a top one day, for example, and, and, I, and I really think tops are cool. The tops just rotate, you know, they spin, they, they, they float around, they're autonomous, and they float around on a table and just uh, slowly lose energy and stop. And so I remember thinking, well, gee, solar power, you know, I could make a top that would be powered by light falling on it because it's such an efficient, low friction thing. And let's see, I need something to push against. I need a source of torque, and that could be a magnet reacting with the Earth's magnetic field. So I could, I could make a, a solar-powered top. And, uh, of course, I realized that that would just be a gizmo that only people like me would buy. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, I won't, I won't put my time and money into that. But, but I just kind of kept it in the back of my mind. And then uh, a few years later, I was talking to my girlfriend uh, at, at that time, Lisa, and I said, well, uh, I could make a solar-powered flying saucer. You know, I was trying to impress her with what I could do with physics. And, uh, and so I, I bet her $50 I could do that, and of course I failed at that. <laughs> but I did, uh, I did uh, have a lot of fun trying that, and it's the kind of thing I would try to do. Uh, so it involves spinning and magnets and solar power. So um, I, uh, I then got a job at a company called Spin Physics in San Diego, uh, because I saw the spin part of it. And it turned out the spin was the spin of the electron, and had, they were part of Kodak, and, and working on magnetic recording. So I spent the next 10 years working on magnetic recording. I learned a lot about magnetics and, and just uh, technology in general, and, um, and continued to work on things at night. I always had something I was working on at night. But uh, I, I finally had some free time and, and, and got to the point where I was thinking about uh, what could I make that would be really cool? I mean, you just think, okay, you're a physicist, you know, you should be able to make something cool. And I was thinking, okay, well, just I could, well, what if I could make an Earth? If I could make a model of the Earth floating, somehow rotating in space? You know, for me, it had to be an autonomous thing. It couldn't be something that's plugged into the wall because that's just another plugged into the wall thing. It had to be something autonomous, alive, the Earth flo floating. And I was just trying to think how I could do that. And then about that time, my kids brought home this little eyeball thing that, it, that is. Uh, uh, floating in fluid, and I thought, well, that's a really cool thing, but it, but it's it it stops as soon as you stop shaking it, and it stops spinning. And I thought, well, that's like my old top observation, you know. And then I and then then I just felt myself saying, yeah, that, I and I know how to make that rotate, and it's floating, and uh, I could make that rotate. I could make it bigger. I could put a graphic on it that's the Earth, and there I'd have my floating, solar-powered, autonomous Earth. And that invention uh, really appealed to me. I was sitting right here when I was holding this ball. And so I asked my wife, Peggy, I said, well, I described it to her. And, and uh, she said, yeah, that'd be cool, uh, which is good, because I had a lot of inventions that uh, she didn't feel that way about. But this one, it's good she approved of it, because uh, that, that meant that I was going to spend all my time since then working on this and all our money working on this. And uh, eventually ran out of money and went looking for investors to get started and everything. And that's a long story. But finally, I got together with a, an old friend of mine from uh, Kodak named Shaw Lin, who's a PhD in electrical engineering. And he had some friends in uh, Asia that could see the potential of this and, and uh, were willing to invest in it. So we got started. Shaw was the CEO and is still the CEO, and I'm the technical guy. Uh, and I just spent all my time in my basement solving problems, or in China, or in Taiwan, or Japan, 
you know, working on this. And, uh, but it's, it's been worth it. Uh, my Uncle Howard, when he looked at it, he was 80 years old, and he said, well, he said, well, Billy, that, that reminds me of something that was left behind by a flying saucer. <laughs> and I took that as a great compliment, uh, and, uh, and my experience has been that people, uh, people appreciate it and, and like it, and that's, that's been fun for me, and, and I appreciate your, your liking this thing, and I hope you found this interesting. <laughs>